Hello, Lawrence. Hello, Lawrence. Hello, Lawrence. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It is my privilege to introduce today's speaker to you. Um, be before I do that, I just want to give a little bit of context. A couple of weeks ago, we ran the first Biophysics in Africa conference using a similar virtual platform. And today's webinar is a wonderful extension of that. Um, yeah, so to introduce the speaker of today to you, and that is Professor Malik Maza, and he's the current incumbent of the UNESCO UNISA Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnology. He holds a PhD in Neutron Quantum Optics from the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, and his research interests encompasses nanosciences, nanotechnology, and advanced materials for energy, water, and health-based technology. So, a very broad um, view of applications. He has initiated and co-founded several national and continental initiatives and has mentored a large cohort of postgraduates from various corners of the African continent. He has published about 650 peer-reviewed publications and has an H index of 70, which is really remarkable. He's a fellow of several academies of sciences which is evidence of his broad and profound impacts across the globe. So it is a great privilege to have Professor Maza here today as our guest speaker. And he's going to talk about from nature to biomimicry towards nanotechnology. So Maza, uh, I'm, I'm Malik, the, the floor is yours. Hello, Malik. Did you fix your microphone problem? Are you, are you muted? Yes. Sorry, sorry. Okay, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Program director, uh, colleagues from uh, uh, different parts of the world, I wish to express my gratitude to all of you for taking off your, off your precious time attending this webinar. And allow me please to express my profound gratitude to the organizers of the African Biophysics uh, society, indeed, as it was highlighted by uh, uh, Chart, is that indeed uh, there was an outstanding uh, event organized by them on uh, biophysics, and that what encouraged me more or less to uh, propose this. So the talk of my uh, uh, contribution today is titled "From Nature via Biomimicry Towards Nanotechnology," and this work is done. This uh, presentation is a, a part of the African Physical Society events. Uh, and it's done, the work that I will be presenting was done within the framework of two major platforms, the NanoScience African Network, NanoAfNet, and the UNESCO UNISA Itamba Labs Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnology. These two events, uh, these two platforms uh, are uh, official platforms. The Nano AFNET is a network of excellence of the African Union and the UNESCO UNISA Itambala Alps Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnology is an initiative of the UNESCO. Uh, while the Nano AFNET is uh, headquartered at Itambala Alps in the Western Cape, not far from Cape Town, the, Nano, uh, the UNESCO UNISA Africa Chair in Nanosciences and Nanotechnology is headquartered and administered at the University of South Africa in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, sorry. 
both of them are in South Africa, but their mandate is a continental one, whereby we host quite a large number of uh, postgrads and junior and emerging scientists, as well as senior scientists from different parts of the continent and the world, involving the members of the diaspora. The outline of my contribution, if time allows, is that I will uh, mention why we are interested in the field of nanosciences and nanotechnology, which is the physics or the chemistry or material science at the nanoscale, and then go towards a number of uh, uh, nanomaterials that we, for which we have uh, uh, copied more or less mother nature through biomimicry, such as the Hemsbok biomimicry for green air conditioning, butterfly biomimicking, biomimicking for uh, to design solar photothermal nanomaterials, and also nanophotonics by using uh, the current hot topic and hot technology of bioengineering. And then move towards uh, the opti uh, some uh, specific nonlinear optical properties of some natural extracts, and then go to self-assembly and self-molecular recognition in sepia ink, and I will hopefully end by some conclusions and foresight if a time allows. And Tiart and Lawrence, please stop me whenever you should, I should stop, please. We embarked, as Tiart has mentioned, our interest is multidisciplinary. And we found, we, we do believe that in effect, uh, we have to go back a little bit to the past, whereby you have uh, such as Descartes, for example, or Galileo Galilei, or Leonardo da Vinci, among others, who were um, and interested not only by physics, optics, uh, philosophy, and so on, but they were at the edge, at the interface of different disciplines of medicine, physics, chemistry, and so on. So we opted to that, uh, to that uh, uh, focus somehow, or to that path, and it's a multidisciplinary. And therefore, uh, originally from physics, we went, met, met, uh, we, uh, we went to material science at the nanoscale, and we found ourselves interacting with engineers, with the chemistry people, with the agriculture, with the environment, uh, with the ecology, geosciences, and of course, quite extensive amount of modeling and uh, biomedical and so on. And that was just natural to embark in this multidisciplinary uh, field of nanosciences and nanotechnology, a way to accelerate or to enhance or further the critical mass of uh, scientists within the continent, and also to try to share the minimum of resources that we have and the equipment that we have in the continent. So the idea is to enhance the critical mass of scientists in particular, emerging young scientists within the continent. My uh, first example, uh, my first uh, topic here is just to show you why nano is extremely important. Nano is not new. Mother Nature has in uh, quite a number of its systems, uh, uh, nano scaled components in each system that it has designed so far. Uh, and uh, Mother Nature has designed things in a way to minimize the energy consumption, the minimum of operation taking place, fast uh, events, in effect, the absorption reactions and so on, they are never in the, time, in the time scale of us in a hour or a minute, but they are in a, from the femtosecond to the nanoseconds and to microseconds. And the first example that I would like to share with your colleagues is the magnetostatic bacteria. A magnetostatic bacteria, colleagues, and you are well aware that uh, bacteria is the first living species since the creation of the world. That is uh, undeniable. And if you take specifically this uh, type of uh, what we call magnetostatic bacteria, this magnetostatic bacteria inside their body they have some crystals, and these crystals, in particular the marine spirillum strain MV4, they have small nanocrystals inside that they have created, and these uh, uh, small crystals, in effect, uh, they align under the magnetic field of the Earth. Yes, indeed, the magnetic field of the Earth is 
small relatively to those that we can have uh, in the lab in the Tesla range. This is extremely small. This is in a Gauss range. Nonetheless, if you take this uh, bacteria and you put it in water in the North Pole, it will move up and down perpendicular to the Earth. If you bring it to the South uh, Pole, it will move up and down perpendicular to the Earth. If we take it to the equator, uh, to Nairobi or something like that, to the, uh, Uganda, to uh, Nevada, in, in the tropics, that bacteria will not move perpendicular. It will move parallel. Why? Because it will follow, uh, it will follow the magnetic field of Earth. And by following it, how it does it? It's the plots that it has made inside its body. These nanocrystals that it made in the nano, they form a necklace according to the magnetic field of Earth. And therefore, it moves according to the magnetic field because these plots. And these plots are either iron sulfide or iron oxide, highly crystalline. And they are in the range of 50 nanometers. And the, the bacteria can make them in different shapes, as the needles, cubes, uh, circles, and so on, and so on, spheres, and so on. And uh, millions of years have this magnetic, uh, this bacteria were living with us. But only in 2005, the doubles and the spirito have explained the mechanism of formation of these nanoplots in the bacteria itself. So just to show you that the nano is not new, that was, there is, the bacteria uses the bio-mineralization bio growth control process inside its body to make these nanoparticles. The second example that I would like to share with you is the photosynthesis. All of us, we know, at least we have a little bit background of it. Well, a leaf is extremely effective absorbing a, a certain type of radiation, the green in particular, at the nearly 100%, and the mechanism taking place uh, uh, with the photon absorption from the sun to uh, decompose the CO2 to oxygen and carbon, and the carbon is re re released to uh, create the carbohydrate and the sugar machinery, which allows the leaf to grow. In effect, uh, uh, the chlorophyll is not the unique component which is of uh, importance in this. No, the granai and the tilakoids are extremely important because the chloroplast is covering all of this. And the, how can I say, the transmission of the electron hole created, it goes through all of these mechanisms and so on within different times, as I mentioned, from the femtosecond to the nanosecond, to the uh, thoughts the second. And the tilakoids and the granai, which are covered by the chlorophyll within the, inside the cell, uh, they are in the nanometer scale. And as you can see, the tilakoids, they bend themselves in a way to have a multilayered system. Why they do it? Because they want to enhance the surface to volume. So to enhance the amount of surface covered by the, the chloro, chlorophyll. And uh, so are the tilakoids linking the different uh, set of granai. So the thickness of uh, uh, the tilakoids is in the nanometer, less than 10 nanometers. And uh, the thickness of a, a bunch of the tilakoids of the granai also is of the order of uh, 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 less than 100 nanometer. And uh, well, a cross section of a leaf shows you this. This is not a drawing. This is exactly an electron microscopy in a cryo freezing, uh, cryo freezed uh, uh, time system where you can clearly see the telacoids and the granai linked, and they are in the nanometer scale. Uh, the other example that is really of a critical importance here is the spider silk. The spider silk, uh, uh, a specific type of uh, uh, spider silk, in particular the one by the, by the Argiopitri fasciata and the Nephi la clavipas, uh, they have some mechanical properties. In particular, I don't want to go through the details, but uh, I am uh, willing to explain more on this. Uh, 
uh, if you go through this uh, mechanical properties, breaking strain and the toughness, which are extremely important uh, in the mechanical properties of any fiber or any metal, and including stainless steel or Kevlar or PBO or the nylon, these are man-made uh, uh, materials. And see colleagues here, the toughness and uh, uh, the breaking strength, a strain of the, these fibers uh, of the man-made materials. Relatively to the one made by the fibers made by the Argiopi trivaciata and the Neve and the clavipas, the toughness here is far higher. And this toughness is high because the fiber of the spider consists of bricklets extremely hard, very, very hard, very tough uh, nanocubes. And these nanocubes, many of them, uh, many bricklets uh, uh, are uh, connected and they are connected by smooth, flexible polymers. So the flexibility of the fiber uh, of the argiopi or the bombix or whatever is due to these polymers here. While the strength and the toughness and the breaking strain is due to the hard nanobricklets less than uh, 50 nanometers in size. Well, also, uh, nano, uh, uh, nano in nature is expressed through the super hydrophobic properties of a number of uh, plants, the leaf of plants in the aloe, for example, where water gives you droplets and it does not flatten on the leaf. Why? Because on the surface of the leaf, the, you have a large amount of uh, spikes. These spikes, they are nano both in their basal plane as well as uh, the transversal plane. And uh, uh, this structure uh, made the, the, uh, make it in a way that the, the, the surface of the leaf is super hydrophobic and it's only in 64, uh, sorry, 62, one year before I come from the world to this world, I was uh, maybe still in the womb of my mother, then uh, I can say it was explained that uh, such a kind of rough surfaces do indeed affect uh, the, uh, uh, the contact angle and therefore the hydrophobicity of the surface. Well, the last king type of experiment that in effect should be mentioned in view of the nano in mother nature is the gecko. In effect, uh, it was the first time when I went to Nigeria at the Obafemi Awolowo University uh, Energy Center. I, well, I really saw quite a number of uh, these geckos all over the, the roof. And I wanted to find out what is this, uh, how it comes that that's a quite a heavy uh, uh, animal can stick still like Spider-Man. I mean, he's heavy, the, how can I say, he's, uh, his toes are small and he can stick. So I went to do my literature and I found out that in effect, uh, uh, the, uh, their toes, they, are, they have millions of uh, spatula like this, and this spatula, uh, the, at the top of it, it's as you can see here, it's uh, uh, some uh, uh, photo. It has uh, uh, like a spatula here, and this spatula on the top of it, it's uh, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, open here, and you have air in it, and its size a little bit is uh, around 250, and you have a pocket of air here, when it comes to the uh, to the surface of the roof, it sticks, and uh, of course it's Van der Waals type force. But uh, a Van der Waals force uh, type uh, of one a spatula multiplied by millions, you do understand that it will definitely give you a huge force, and this huge force will compensate the gravitation wave. Uh, uh, force due to the weight of the of the gecko. So uh, of course, uh, uh, a group in Italy and in MIT they have uh, biosynthesized this type of ma of uh, materials using carbon nanotubes etched at the surface, and uh, 
it happened that uh, the gloves coated with that can indeed allow you to war uh, to uh, uh, how can I say walk on the on the roof. Uh, I have not seen the results, but they gave uh, uh, they gave uh, a curve which shows yes, indeed it can be done, and we can have a Superman type uh, 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 gloves. The case, the first case, experimental case that I would like to show uh, share with you in our activities is the use is the biomimic of the Hansbok to design and to bioengineer materials which would allow us to control the heat as the Hansbok does it. What is the Hansbok? Hansbok is this beautiful animal. It's the logo of Qatar Airways in effect. Uh, before there was uh, this population of the Hansbok, it was uh, stretching from the Middle East to Africa and the hunting uh, trophy of it has made it disappearing in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, they call it Al-Maha in the Middle East, and it nearly disappeared, and they have introduced it recently, but not on its form like this. It's a whitish one, and you have some now also uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Kenya and a little bit in the Somali land, not Somali coast, the Somali land. Uh, but in... Uh, in the southern hemisphere, in Botswana and uh, in uh, Namibia and South Africa, they are a protected species. That you know, anyway, the most important uh, this uh, animal is capable not to, to drink water for uh, days, for weeks, for months. Yet, indeed, it can walk in a very harsh sand. It can reach 56 degrees Celsius, yeah, and uh, this. Uh, Oryx, uh, this uh, Hans book or the Oryx does not sweat. Why? Because it controls the heat of its body. And this work is done by quite a number of a number of fellows. Uh, uh, Balan Gong from Senegal, Mohamed Khanfouch from Morocco, and Spunton Kanyile from uh, South Africa, Nagla Nu'man from Sudan, Itani Madiba from South Africa, and uh, Alin Sim, of course, from Cameroon and uh, Botumelo from South Africa. So I'm sharing with you their, their results. Uh, uh, we biomimic this animal in view of designing smart coating, which would allow us to control heat coming from the sun or released uh, from a home during the winter and during the summer. And the heat exchanged extensively uh, or from the sun to the door to the house or to a, a car and inside car and uh, are the windows. So we have to make fabricate the material which biomimics the Hemsbok coating these uh, glasses of a, a house or a, a car uh, in the same way as the Hemsbok. And just to position it, please remember these numbers that I am sharing with you. For the moment, we have, a, we, worldwide, we do use 1.6 billion air conditioning in the world. By 2050, it is expected that we will be using 5.6 billion air conditioning systems. And the energy to operate this 5.6 uh, billion air conditioning is the equivalent of the energy used currently by the USA, Europe, oh. Japan, uh, together. So you would do, you would understand. <laughs> Oh, 
Can you mute everybody, please? <laughs> Lawrence? Yes, I can hear. I'm trying to mute everyone. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> I mean, me, I mean, do me, I'm a good, good deal. Lawrence, could you please mute everybody? Mr. Uli, 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 oh. I got the, got the, got the, got the. Took the look at that, 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 that. Lawrence? I have removed that person. I think yeah, yes, I'm here. Okay, so now I am going to unmute Maza. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that should be it. Brian, is that it? Is that? I think we're good. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna... I've removed him. It's fine. I don't know who this person is. But... Can I proceed? Uh... Yes. Lawrence? Yes, Please I think you can. I... Yeah, I'm really sorry. No, that uh... was, that's my that's my fault. I was I didn't think this would happen, but I, I but I was afraid it would be it would happen, and so it did. Anyway, okay, I'm I think really, you can proceed. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really sorry, colleagues, for such. Well, the point is that in this example that I would like to share with you is biomimicking the Hans book to design and bioengineer or to engineer a material which is smart and intelligent, which duplicates the behavior of the Hans book for application in air conditioning. And uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, colleagues, I would like you really to uh, take these numbers for the moment uh, to regulate heat uh, in humid and hot countries. Uh, for the moment, worldwide, we use 1.6 billion uh, air conditioner currently. By 2050, it is expected that we will be using 5.6 billion units. The energy, relay, uh, the, in, the energy uh, to uh, operate these 5.6 billion uh, air conditioning uh, units would be the equivalent of the energy used currently by the USA, Europe, and Japan. And you do understand this is a huge, absolutely huge. And with the climate change, more and more uh, certainly air conditioning units will be used in different parts, not only in the uh, uh, in the building sector, but also the automotive sector and others. So it is necessary to come with solutions, uh, smart solution. And as you are aware that uh, by 2050, we would have a, a huge exodus from the rural areas to the urban areas. And the skyscrapers architectures would boom, would boom everywhere uh, in, in the world, different parts of the world, Africa included. And therefore, it is necessary to coat these uh, glass windows of the skyscrapers and the roofs, even the walls, with a smart coating which would reflect the heat from the sun during the, the day uh, and, and, and during the summer and allow the heat to come in during the winter. So, for uh, such uh, colleagues, uh, uh, the sun will be there. It will emit more or less the same type of fraction of light, 5% of the UV, 43% of the visible, but more than 50% of infrared. That this infrared has to be regulated, which means that in a hot summer, the heat has to be reflected. And in the cold winter, the heat has to come in. And this material, this coating, coating uh, glass windows has to be has to be uh, smart and for us such colleagues uh, we will be use uh, we will be biomimicking this uh, uh, hemsbok how the uh, hemsbok regulates its uh, heat, the heat of its body well during the during the night when the temperature is low during the night it consumes a huge amount of oxygen a huge amount of oxygen. And during the day, it consumes less oxygen. By doing, and again in the night, it consumes less oxygen. During the day, it takes on less, and the night uh, more, and so on. And it does it in a reversible way. So we are uh, looking for a material which would behave like this, like in this hysteresis. At a high temperature, it has to have low resistance instead of oxygen consumption. So the equivalent of the oxygen consumption should be the electric resistance. So the material that we are looking for should have low resistance at high temperature and the high resistance at uh, yeah low resistance at high temperature and low resistance a uh, high resistance and high uh, at low temperature. And such a material is an old one, which is called vanadium dioxide. As you can see, the resistance of this material versus the temperature has that uh, behavior uh, with the hysteresis. And the hysteresis depends on the quality of the film. Here is a spin coated film. Here is a, a thin film made by laser ablation. And here is a, 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 huge, a bulk crystal. Nonetheless, the one who does this is this uh, very old crystal. It's a mod type, what we call crystal VO2. And this VO2 does it. We know very well now the science of it. In effect, uh, at low temperature, at low temperature, it has a band gap of 0 0.7 electron volt. And at a uh, high temperature, this band gap here closes because the d orbitals here which were splitted they recombine again and the d band by 
recombining, the there we how can I say that the band gap is uh, uh, closed and it becomes uh, metal, and this change here is reversible. What is it, what what does it mean when the band gap opens at low temperature, closes at high temperature, opens at low temperature, closes at temperature? That means there is a change of the refractive index, and this refractive index, when it changes, it is extremely important. As you can see, for example, at high temp, this is the spectra or the dispersion relation of the refractive index at different temperature within the visible range and the infra near infrared range. As you can see, this is at high temperature. These are uh, this at low temperature, and these are uh, these are at low temperature. These are at high temperature. At at one thousand nanometer in particular, as you can see, at low temperature is three point two, and at high temperature it decreases at one point six. For any optical expert, he, he or she would understand the outstanding uh, this outstanding change due to this change. Uh, uh, we that we can explain through the Lorentz and the Drude model now, it's not a problem. We know the physics, uh, the science of it. That the change of the refractive index, it induces something which is extremely important. If you have a glass slide coated with a VO2, at low temperature, you will find out the transmission in the infrared and the near infrared, the transmission is quite oh, the transmission of this uh, coated glass with the VO2 is quite high. It's above 50 percent, as you can see. This is the optical transmission measured uh, 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 when the film is cold, and when it's hot, the transmission, the optical transmission of this glass coated with this VO2 decreases, as you can see close to 20, it can reach zero. What does it mean? That means uh, a glass, uh, uh, this glass window, uh, a glass coated with this VO2, uh, at low temperature, it allows the solar heat from the sun to be transmitted. When it's hot, uh, when the atmosphere is hot, this coated glass uh, uh, will reflect the infrared. And therefore, it stops the heat when it's hot outside, and it allows the heat to come in from the sun when it's cold in the winter. And you can do it also on a very large uh, uh, surfaces, in particular, for example, glasses of uh, uh, a window at home or in a car. As a typical toy that uh, exemplifies this, here you have two small toys cars, uh, houses, one both with two windows, each window, each one non-coated with a glass, uh, with a VO2, that smart material, and the other one coated with a VO2. And inside, as you can see, you, have, you see a thermometer. And the, both of them are uh, 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 lightened by a, a, a lamp, an infrared lamp, and this lamp, uh, sorry, not an infrared lamp, lamp which uh, imitates the sun at 1.5 sun. And as you can see, the one which is uh, uh, shining on the house uh, with a glass non-coated, the thermometer measures around 42 degrees Celsius, while the other one which is coated with the uh, with the VO2, with this smart material, the temperature inside is 33 degrees Celsius. So which means the maximum of the heat from this uh, artificial sun is reflected. While here, the majority of the infrared radiation are transmitted. So you can see that the temperature inside while co uh, coating the glass uh, with this smart material is less. Uh, and while it's here high, and it's nearly 10 degrees, nine, eight degrees difference. And thermal, uh, in terms of uh, air conditioning, this eight degrees uh, in difference is huge, is extremely huge. Therefore here, there is a 
smart air conditioning taking place and here no smart condition uh, heat uh, air conditioning taking place and the second case that I would like to share you colleagues and uh, sorry let me just come back to this so in the future uh, yet we uh, this technology is not available uh, for the moment because the idea is to reduce the cost uh, by making a large surfaces uh, of this material and this is the challenge but it will come it will come soon than later uh, and the, this you would understand that this coating will be used in sky scrapper uh, and the normal uh, smart uh, normal windows in uh, housings as well as in cars the second example that i would like to share with you colleagues is uh, how we have uh, biomimicked the butterfly or how this uh, the solar energy community involved in the csp has tried to biomimic butterfly uh, struct wing structures to design selective solar absorber for uh, concentrated solar power. And in this, quite a number of uh, fellows have been working on it, uh, in particular, and uh, the three fellows who are loyal UNESCO awardees. And uh, this one is also not only loyal UNESCO awardee, but the Royal Society uh, awardee. Uh, from Ghana, Juliet, from uh, Uganda, Angela Karoro, and Zebi from Ethiopia. Well, uh, you have noticed that in effect the beautiful, uh, the beautiful uh, butterflies, they are in the tropical uh, forests. Tropical forests are extremely very dense. So then light comes uh, difficult in a uh, very uh, suddenly, uh, slowly, or more or less, not effectively reaching the uh, the soil, and therefore the butterflies, the how can I say, they have the designed with the years, uh, they uh, managed to have colored sections uh, with colors green, red, blue, whatever. These colors are for mating to attract the male for mating. While the black sections, the black section are structured in a way, it's a nanostructures, these, the uh, catch light, in particular the infrared, and the catch that uh, 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 solar light, the visible and the near infrared, and convert it, this black section, it, con it converts that light to heat. And this heat is transferred to the body of, uh, of the butterfly to heat manage uh, the temperature of its body for its living. So the idea is to have to design black coating as effective as the butterfly wings, the ones here, and uh, by uh, using not a dye, but uh, 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 nanostructuring of the surface or combining both. And this is extremely important in a CSP technology. This is uh, the solar uh, CSP con uh, 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 plant at Nor One in Morocco. As you can see, you have here uh, parabolic mirrors, uh, and in, in the with the, these parabolic mirrors, you have a tube. And this tube here, it's stainless tube or copper, and you have water. So light is reflected from the sun, is reflected by this mirror to the receiver, to the tube here, to heat it. And by heating it, it will, uh, it will heat the water inside, and therefore that water goes through the standard cycle. Just to see it clearly how it works, uh, here is the tube at the focal point of the concentrated solar uh, uh, mirror. The uh, radiation are concentrated on the receiver. And the receiver, in effect, is a tube. Here, copper or uh, uh, stainless tube or aluminium, uh, but mainly stainless steel or copper. And inside there is oil, uh, water or oil, but water, generally speaking. And this stainless steel is coated with a black material. And this black material has a coating 
has to absorb as much as possible of light from the sun and the near infrared and convert it to heat and that heat goes to uh, through the substrate here to the liquid here or the oil to heat it and therefore to go to the normal turbines and so on to generate electricity. So the design is to have a black material and that black coating should have a low reflectance in the visible and the near infrared and a high reflectance in the IR, far infrared. So it means it has to have a high absorption in the visible and the low emissivity. So the same thing here for this butterfly that many of you have seen. The black spots here, they have a selectivity like a solar absorber, as you remember. Zero, nearly minimum of reflection in the visible near infrared, a high reflectance in the near infrared and infrared. So, and the white sections, the white section, they don't have that kind of behavior. So you see clearly the black section is used to heat the body of the butterfly, any butterfly having a bu uh, black stuff. And uh, so the idea is to create surfaces which would behave like that. This is the copper, and this is copper attacked in a certain way. I think here it's the work of, uh, uh, of Gide. Yeah, Gide, who is from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and well, or Karoro, or Angela Karoro, not Angela Karoro, uh, one of them, anyway. So here, indeed, they have designed by nanostructuring the surface of copper. It becomes black, as you can see, and it's a response, it's more or less uh, close to, not perfect, but close to. And in effect, uh, the best ones are, which are designed for a, a stable at high temperature, they can stand a high temperature, 730 degrees Celsius, are made by platinum alumina, as you can see. Here, the black is the experimental curve reflectivity. It's, you can see, this is the hemispherical reflectivity, is low, is not zero, but low, and quite high in the infrared, and uh, it's more or less not uh, perfect, but it's nearly perfect relatively to the one, the standard one, at least in the USA. If your uh, selective solar absorber has to go to the market, it has to be equivalent to this one, to the dashed curve. And as you can see, ours is closed. It's not far, but it's closed. And that is uh, due to this experimental, uh, to, how can I say, approach in biomimicking butterflies somehow. Uh, this is a black here, as you can see. The absorption is uh, uh, 0 0.97 and the emissivity is 2%. Not zero, not one, but close. And we continue working on that. The third example that I would like really, or the fourth example that I would like to share with you is the two. Is the two uh, uh, more or less uh, for the young generation of uh, young scientists and emerging scientists in Africa and the South is to understand that you are sitting on a, on a, a huge reservoir of uh, knowledge of know-how, in particular, the uh, sorry, colleagues, in particular, indigenous plants, and these indigenous plants are unique, and our traditional medicine in the south, we should not neglect. Remember that more than ninety-seven percent of uh, the medical of medicine that you are taking currently are originally derived from natural extracts, from natural phytocompounds, have been bio or uh, engineered in the chemical lab after, but the original one was found in the nature. So with the SARS-CoV-2, it has to give us, in particular you young scientists, to embark in this. Anyway, for me, I would like to share with you the usage of Hudia Gordoni uh, natural extract to make 
cerium oxide which with unique properties. And this work is done by uh, Ntombe Di Klopo from South Africa for her PhD and uh, Sintuano Lofondo from South Africa during her MSc and now she continue her PhD. And this uh, uh, Hudia Gordoni is an African plant that you find only in the Southern hemisphere, in particular in Namibia and South Africa. It has this P50, what you call P50 uh, phytocompounds, which allows you once in a mechanism in the right conditions to give you aldehydes. And these aldehydes are extremely effective in the biosynthesis processes. This is called Hudia Gordoni, and uh, by the Hoi San, the, the first, the first uh, communities to populate uh, the southern part of Africa, uh, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and, and South Africa, and Mozambique, and so on. These are the people, uh, the Hoi San, like we call them Hoi San. They call it Khap. And uh, this, uh, we are interested by cerium oxide because we want to show that is uh, an ideal material for, uh, uh, for nanocosmetics. And we were targeting because it has a, a band gap uh, clo uh, uh, as, ma as close as the TiO2 as well as the ZNO, but with the advantage in terms of ROS, in terms of reactive ox, uh, oxygen species, oxidative species, it is low relatively to the others. So it's not toxic to the skin. Anyway, but because also use it extensively for CO2 solar conversion uh, for the SOFCs, for the oxygen storage capacity as phosphorus and as fluorescent marking. Well, uh, combining cerium nitrate with the natural extract of this Houdia uh, uh, Gordoni powder containing these P50 compounds, which are a, which is able to good, give the, uh, the birth to aldehydes. We can synthesize, as you can see, this is a high resolution. You can't have beta, at least in uh, South Africa, with our tents. You can see clearly that you have a quantum dot, a nanocrystal surrounded by amorphous, and uh, this is a cerium oxide, as you can see. This is to a bar of two nanometers. This is at uh, amorphous, a very small uh, uh, amount, and this uh, very small crystals. This is a higher, little bit large crystal. So this is the highly crystalline, as you can see clearly, spot of diffraction, while here is annular type of diffraction. It's equivalent of uh, amorphous type, but uh, with a local ordering, but here it's highly crystalline. And it takes place at room temperature without any acid or, or without any artificial base. It's only with fetal compounds from mother nature, straightforward. And when you go to do, you can clearly see that they are very small uh, nanocrystals. They are quantum dots, colleagues. They are quantum dots. And when you go and check the, the purity, you will find out there are some calcium and uh, some potassium uh, from the natural extract, but they can be removed easily. This palladium and gold, it, it, become, it comes from the, the coating itself because we want to see how much carbon also is inside. And when you go to do the study of surface and interface characterization, you will find the uh, structure, uh, the uh, signature of XRD of a fluorite, a pure fluorite, and so on and so on. Pure with FTR with Raman, you find that's a high quality and so on. And with the XPS, you will find that the cerium is only on four plus uh, uh, valence. That's it's a pure cerium oxide two with a minimum of defects. Who says who says better? So here, when it comes to the optical uh, optical uh, uh, response. It has a heavy side mathematical function uh, uh, response. It's low in the visible, uh, in the UV uh, blue. It's very low at the statistic of detection, nearly zero. And it has a plateau nearby uh, 
in the visible range and the near infrared. That, and this we know more or less it's due to the transition from the oxygen to the C4 uh, F levels and so on. And better than that, better than that, it's that the ROS, the production of the reactive oxide species, oxidative species, it's very low. It's near la, close to zero relatively to zinc oxide and the TRO2. That means this cream made by this cerium oxide is not toxic to the skin at all, and relatively to uh, quite the products in the in the uh, in the uh, market. See the efficiency of this powder. It goes through a whole V U U V A U V two U V B and U V C. So it shows us how bio. Uh, how can I say? Uh, combining natural plants and investigating their physical properties. Uh, and embarking in a biophysics uh, biophysics uh, uh, study makes a really life very, very attractive, the science very, very attractive. The one that I would like to show you indeed colleagues is one of the red phosphors, europium oxide that all of you have your on in your laptops as much as we are speaking now. The red colors that you see on my laptop here is uh, due to the europium oxide okay and uh, so is the red color in the in, in your cell phones and this specific work that i would like to share with you is uh, the work uh, uh, finalized by uh, abdullah diallo from senegal and well as I mentioned, the red, uh, the europium uh, six oxide is the, how can I say, it depends on the uh, europium valence, three plus or two plus, it gives you the red or the blue, and it's used extensively in all our lamps, of course, in the cell phones, in this flat screens, and, and all, any, anything uh, using flat screens. And here, the market of it, uh, anyway, I will not go through this. I will send the, the presentation to the organizers uh, uh, if you are interested and they will uh, pass that to you. And here, we use also natural extract uh, rich in quite a number of uh, uh, phytochemical compounds from this plant which called uh, Roy Bosch. Uh, uh, it's called Aspalatus linearis. It's called, uh, we make it from it, uh, rooibos tea, well known in South Africa, uh, because it is really, you can find it, this plant, you find it only in South Africa. And in South Africa, you will find it only in one place, not far from where I live here. It's a specific area in between two chain of mountains. So it's a specific biosphere. Anyway, if we take, uh, this uh, 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 natural extract from these plants, and we combine it, it with the europium acetate, we get at the end, after 24 hours, with this little uh, uh, annealing of around, heating around 45, 45 degrees Celsius. Uh, and after 40, uh, one night, we end by getting powder. And this powder, in fact, it is a set of small nano uh, crystals. As you, will, as you can see, a bar of 20 nanometers. And they are quite uh, monodispersed in size, uh, colleagues. And uh, uh, some crystals are amorphous, but others are highly crystalline, as you can see. Uh, uh, and uh, between 15 nanometers in size and 20, and but they are highly crystalline. And again, when you go to run physical investigation of surface and interface, being it EDS, uh, being it Raman, uh, XRD, being it Raman, being it uh, uh, EXAFS, it's mainly Europium 3 plus and it's uh, BCC Europium uh, uh, oxide and this confirm the BCC, the Raman mode confirm the BCC uh, stuff and so on. And the most important is to see how this Europium oxide Luminous phosphorus. So you come with the, uh, an excitation in the UV, 
at 254 nanometers. When you excite it, you have red. It emits in the red, this powder. And as you can see, this emission is very well, is strong. It's very well identified. Is the 5D0 7 F2. It's the hypersensitive forced electric dipole transition. And uh, the time of, uh, efficient, uh, of emission is as in the normal ones, but except that in this case, you have used no acid, no base, artificial base, synthetic base or synthetic oxide, no harmful uh, uh, oxido reduction uh, liquid, uh, chemical, and you have not used any vacuum to make these nanoparticles, it's just by green nanochemistry and it luminous as well, if not better than the ones uh, used, made by uh, normal stuff. The, the one that I would like really to share with you is the work made on, uh, to show the self-assembly in sepia ink. You know, the octopus, uh, not octopus, but uh, the sepia. It has uh, uh, calamar, yes, calamar. It's a family of calamari. Uh, and uh, in the sea to hide when it seems that it's in danger, the sepia or the calamari ejects uh, black powder. The sepia one is truly black. Well, and this work that I would like to share with you uh, was the work made by uh, uh, Agnes Buni Yuri Wuze and other beautiful mind again from Rwanda. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, sepia uh, uh, comes from the specifically the one that we have investigated comes out from uh, uh, comes out from uh, 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 the black the black sepia ink of this uh, animal here. Uh, and in effect, it, it contains some uh, melanin. And this uh, melanin, in fact, uh, 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 it contains two major compounds, uh, two major uh, large molecules, the dehydroxyindole, DHI, and uh, its carboxylic version, the DHICA. So we investigated, uh, uh, we investigated their properties. And we found out that if you take, the, if you get the powder of this, uh, of this black ink, in effect, they are a form of toroidal, large toroidal uh, particles. And if you zoom and you go to single out some particles, you will find out that you have spherical nanoplatelets, truly spherical nanoplatelets. And when you zoom more on this, uh, uh, nanoparticles at the edge in particular when you go to high resolution you will find out that in effect you have uh, chains of uh, dhika uh, 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 forming a semi-ordered or cross-linked nanofibrils with a, a lantern sheet spacing between four 3.7 to four angstroms consisting with the in line with the pi pi's uh, covalent stacking uh, in very well structured system uh, related to self assembly. The most important thing here is that uh, black ink is due to light trapping. And we wanted to find out what's the reason for which it uh, traps light. And we have investigated, of course, with the physical methods, an armada of them. We have found that indeed its absorbance is not very high, but it's quite very broad, very, very broad. And we found out that in effect, uh, it's high in the UV and the blue, and it's quite constant in the visible to the near infrared. But what is extremely intriguing is that we have found out that in some parts, this one and this one, there are there is a peculiar interference fringe system. And uh, while the first uh, interference systems, we, we can clearly see them, but others, it's not really easy. We have to go to high resolution spectrophotometer in the infrared, that means synchrotron, to see this origin. But the fact that 
but the fact that we have uh, interference fringes in this range, that means there is a, uh, a layering of the order of uh, uh, the wavelength, at least, of uh, an ordering uh, of the order of five, 800 nanometers. Sorry, in this system, and we are still working on it. We will definitely continue and uh, shed light on the origin of this interference here, here, and there. I think the last one that I would like to share you, co colleagues, is the the work made by uh, Siddiqui Zongo from Burkina Faso on uh, 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 on uh, the dye or the the red the, the compounds which gives a green uh, which gives the red color to the hibiscus or uh, hibiscus is all over the world and in the hibiscus in particular the red color when we extract the uh, the the red dye from the flower by heating it a little bit or by freeze drying the, the extract, we get the red powder here. And this red powder, in effect, uh, it, uh, it is rich in anthocyanins and the anthocyanin skeleton, it's a double bond, single bond, uh, rich in this single bond, double bond. And this uh, is rich in, uh, uh, contains a high population of delocalized pi electrons uh, in their skeleton here. And so far, if there are pi electrons, therefore there is a chi three behavior. For such, we have had uh, Siddiqui has investigated uh, their properties, and he found there is an absorption uh, within the visible and near infrared edge. And therefore, indeed, if we come with a laser within that range, we will be able to measure the uh, the chi three. So he took the six uh, 532 nanometers neon dim yak doublet frequency and used the Z-scan, the standard Z-scan technique uh, with the open and closed aperture with this uh, well-established uh, physical method, optical method. He has been able to show that he, it has uh, an optical limiting behavior for those who are not uh, uh, expert in the field, which means that uh, after certain for low intensities, the transmission of that uh, dye uh, uh, it will be linear, linear. But when the when the intensity of the laser reaches a certain value, it saturates. It does not transmit higher values at all. And the same thing for uh, other high high concentrations. Anyway, the 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 pro the point that it saturates. Uh, this is what we call optical limiting. And if there is an optical limiting, there is a, an analog pro, uh, there is a nonlinear behavior. And running the Z-scan, he was able to get uh, uh, the chi-3, which is not negligible, 10 to minus six uh, uh, times these values. And the, the nonlinear part is not zero. It's certainly small, 10 to minus four, Yes, use, but it is there. And well, what is a really unique uh, colleagues uh, uh, with this specific uh, uh, paper is that the idea, I got it from students when I was teaching at uh, Nelson Mandela African uh, Institute for Science and Technology in Abuja, when uh, Prof. Wolese Boyejo was the uh, the provost and the chancellor of that uh, institute. It was the students from there, from different part of the, uh, from Africa, from, uh, I do remember, it was from Mad Madagascar, from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Burkina Faso and so on. And also uh, with the discussion with uh, uh, Al Qaradawi from Kuwait, Diallo from Senegal, Siddiqui from Burkina Faso, Pasha Santunzi from, uh, South Africa and uh, Saeed al-Rahman, uh, Pakistani from Morocco. And by that colleagues, I wish really to express my gratitude to all of you and uh, 
by this, I would like just to uh, mention that uh, this work would have never been done without the contribution of all these fellows and quite a number are, are not here present, but due to this uh, large amount of fellows from uh, uh, Juliet uh, for the optical measurements from Ghana uh, 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 and colleagues from India, uh, sorry, colleagues from Libya, from war zones. So I, I thank you for your uh, time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Malik. This was really fascinating. Yes, nature is beautiful, it's extremely elegant and complex, but you have shown the ability to mimic some of its aspects and that is really awesome. Um, yeah, I would just like to apologize for the interruption that we had halfway by a couple of people who were pretty desperate for attention. Um, so we took a chance with this webinar um, by keeping participation open, but we'll make sure that our future webinars will be more foolproof by asking you to take 10 seconds or so to register for this webinar. Okay, I would like now to open the floor for questions and I'm sure that there will be plenty of questions. Um, I will take a couple of questions and we have run out of time, but um, if you're able to stay, you're welcome to, to ask some questions. And if you would like to ask a question, I would like to ask you to please raise your hand by using the hand raising icon, which you can find at the bottom uh, when you click on reactions. So um, after that, if I announce that you can ask question, you can unmute yourself and then go ahead. Right, I see that there's a question from Mihao Guisawa. So please unmute yourself and go ahead. Oh, uh, hello, uh, thank you for this beautiful talk. Uh, I have a question about the coating that is inspired uh, by 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 the by 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 Oryx's, by by Gemsbok. Uh, you showed that the threshold temperature is sixty eight degrees, uh, like a cut of temperature be, be, between uh, the absorption or transmission of, of, of radiation and uh, reflection of radiation. Can this temperature be changed somehow? Uh, using the nanotechnology or, or chemical modifications of coating. Correct, Michel, you are absolutely correct. In effect, the major, before the challenge was uh, <clears throat> to reduce, to shift, to tune that temperature. And indeed, it's possible to tune it by doping with the tungsten or molybdenum. And uh, uh, the TC uh, de decreases with the concentration uh, with the molybdenum or uh, Tungsten, but generally speaking, a tungsten. Yes, it is possible. And if I may, is it then possible to, let's say, go down to 20 degrees? Or... Yes, of course. Oh, fantastic. Yes, yes. Except that, uh, how can I say, the ideal is to have 25. So to ensure that uh, it's room temperature, at least in uh, non hot countries. But this is, uh, it is possible, yes, by doping with tungsten. But when you dop with the tungsten, Unfortunately, the, um, uh, the, the modulation, the, uh, the, this modulation here, well, let me just go to the optical one. Uh, the modulation, the maximum transmission to the minimum transmission. When you drop with the tungsten, this modulation, the gap, the value of it decreases. So we are working on other strategies on in parallel strategies to reduce the temperature while keeping large this modulation. But there are quite a number of, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, groups worldwide now working on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, let me see if there's another question. If you have a question, please use the hand raising icon, which you can find at the bottom of reactions. Yes, I see there's a question from Mr. Ali Tala Kalios, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, first, it was a very nice presentation, and thank you, uh, Prof. Maza, for it. Uh, just I want to ask something regarding the uh, green synthesis, right? I uh, 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 just want to have your opinion, Professor, that uh, uh, you, you, uh, we create a lot of materials from the plants, right? 
uh, and there, I, it seems that there is some kind of you know uh, uh, translating them to the commercial level or uh, uh, translating them to the industry. Uh, it seems a bit difficult or it seems a bit far away. Uh, so, so we have a lot of materials, right, from green synthesis from one plant or other plant, but it, uh, but their translation to the uh, field to the industry. Uh, uh, what, what, uh, what are your thoughts about it? I just want to have your perspective on that. Thank you so much, uh, Ali. I'm really grateful to you. I'm really, uh, how can I say, I consider you as a, a role model. I mean, you are in Pakistan and uh, uh, how can I say, it's a little bit late, but doesn't matter. The green uh, the biosynthesis or the bioengineering of nanoparticles, uh, you do remember, Ali, at the, at the beginning, whenever you send the publication, it's rejected automatically. They say it's not uh, serious. But now they started, how uh, can I say, journals, they have accepted now uh, that it is a hot topic and the citations and the publication in this field is rocketing. Now, the, because the scientific community has now accepted that it is uh, a, a green bioprocessing is a, a, a solution. Now, the, uh, the challenges is to produce in a mass and therefore to translate this to a, a market. So therefore uh, we have, uh, as in your case and our, in our case uh, uh, in Pakistan, I know that you are extremely very active in it. In India, the same. Uh, now quite a number of countries in, the, in Europe, in Japan, in China and the US uh, are starting to be involved in it. So phase one is that uh, biosynthesis, bioengineering of nanoparticles has been accepted as a field by itself. This is a fantastic achievement. Now, we have to tackle this bioengineering, uh, uh, this uh, biosynthesis as an engineer. So we need uh, to attack it under that angle of engineering for mass production. How much I put, First of all, how, uh, what is the photo compound who is the, the chelating agent? So to, what, therefore, to identify the plant which contains the highest amount of that phyto compound. And from that, we have to have uh, to quantify how much precursor I have to put and how much natural extract and its concentration to be put so to get a kilogram, 10 kilogram, 100 kilogram. So when we do this and we reach a mass production, then there it will be extremely very competitive because as I mentioned, for example, the case, uh, the case of this uh, cerium oxide, this cerium oxide, it will be definitely absorbed by the cosmetic industry because uh, the cerium oxide, uh, biosynthesized at least by this natural extract, it has a, a fantastic cutoff, a fantastic optical selectivity. In addition, it has relatively to the normal uh, zinc oxide and TiO2, which are used in cosmetics, which have uh, quite a high ROS production, this serum has zero. So it's not toxic at all, even at a high concentration. So you would understand that when we publish this paper, the uh, industry will jump on it and will try to, how can I say, to make such a kind of serum oxide. So it will come, Ali, it will come, but we have to tackle it uh, under the angle of an engineer to produce kilograms or 100 kilograms. And as scientists, it's not our job. This is a job of uh, engineering optimization. So how can I say, in our case, the unique thing to do is to submit, uh, to, dip, uh, to deposit a patent, but to produce mass stuff, you have to uh, work with the uh, engineers and uh, mass production industries. I hope that I have responded to your question as expected, I hope. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, thank you for this very elaborate and very interesting answer. Uh, let me allow one last question before we conclude this webinar. Yes, I see there's another question from Michal Gustavo. Um, let me just wait a couple of seconds to see if there's maybe someone else who would like to ask a question. Okay, I see there's a question in the chat. How far is the feasibility for these biomimic natural materials to the device making level at the present stage? Well, at the present stage, uh, the, the challenge is to make large surfaces. And large surfaces of, let's say, for the thermochromic VO2, which biomimics the Hemsbok, um, the challenge is to make large surfaces uh, while keeping modulation very high and the transition very low. And for as such, for the large, uh, uh, for the large coatings, it's made by chemical methods, but the chemical methods are not as effective as the physical methods, vacuum. But the vacuum uh, methods are expensive. So the idea is to make it to produce large, keeping the cost low. And these are prerogative of engineering. So for the moment, as I mentioned, it, quite a large amount of groups are working on, on it. And well, the, I must admit, since the 1958, the first uh, paper coming on the VO2 uh, by Morin et al. Uh, and after Sir Neville Mott explaining the phenomena theoretically, uh, the, the community has made a huge amount of efforts and sooner or later, I think in 20 years, maybe before I pass away, I would see uh, such uh, devices, but it's coming, it's really coming. Okay, thank you. And then there's a last question in the chat. Um, so, Prof. Marza, thank you for the interesting presentation on the thermochromic property of VO2. What do you think about the green synthesis of VO2? Can we scale it up? Uh, well, for the VO2 uh, bio biosynthesis, yes, uh, we have demonstrated it indeed. Our publication in the literature, which is the, uh, uh, how can I say, related to it. And uh, we are working on it as a group. Uh, and hopefully, whenever there will be sound results, we will definitely be able to share the results uh, with your colleagues. But we are working on it, and it's a potential path that I encourage everybody to embark, embark in. What is a nice chart, uh, if you allow me just to add on this, what is sound with the with the bioengineering of nanoparticles by this method is that first of all, it's clean. It's related to SDG, I think uh, 12 of 13, green processing. So uh, it requires only, uh, how can I say, it is not hazardous. You don't use any acid or artificial base. So you don't buy Sigma Aldrich product or Merck. No, the products are, the the, the, the chelating agents are the phyto compounds themselves. And therefore, uh, it's cost effective. I now am very well aware in a number of African countries, you just cannot easily get uh, chemicals from overseas. And these chemicals, the precursors are made all of them uh, overseas in Europe and the US or in uh, China or in India. and. Uh, uh, other countries, but uh, here you can go to the bush, you can identify some plants, you go to the, how can I say, to the elders who are very well aware about the phytochemistry and traditional medicine, you ask them, they will guide you towards uh, outstanding uh, plants and use these plants, not only for the biosynthesis, and, uh, but also to add value to indigenous plants and knowledge. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Maza. This is really inspiring. 
So I wish that we could keep on for another hour or so, but I'm sure that everyone has some other obligations. So I would like to thank you again for a very inspiring, a very fascinating presentation. And I hope that you have inspired, especially some of the students to embark on, on this, um, on a similar, uh, on some of these topics, which are very interesting. So I would like to thank everyone for their participation. Please note that this um, presentation was recorded. We are going to cut out the interruption and it's going to put on YouTube. Um, so you're welcome to go through the presentation again, the recorded one on your own time. And we hope that you will participate again in our future webinars. So I would like to um, wish everyone to stay safe, stay healthy and wishing you all the best. Thank you.